What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Sports Talk with Broads. A little different energy today. You know, the birds fall to the Seahawks. We will get there. As always, follow me on Twitter at Sports and Broads. This is where you will see where my latest episodes have been dropped. Call into the show. Talk about anything. Talk about the Eagles' loss. Talk about the huge game that the Eagles have next week in L.A. against the Rams. All you have to do is on your iPhone, use your voice memo app, record yourself, and send it to sportsandbroads at gmail.com. And lastly, the message boards. We have a new member. We have people talking. We have people discussing topics. It's awesome. www.sportstalkwithbroads.boards.net The information will be in the description. Let's begin. So I had to take a deep breath last night. In the, in the nose, out the mouth. And I just had to process what happened. I had to think about records of teams that won it in the years past. 16-0, and 15-1, and 14-2. I mean, these aren't common records that happen all the time. You're going to lose football games. I think we got outcoached. I think... You know, we got out outworked to an extent, and there were definitely self-inflicted wounds. I mean, Carson Wentz fumbling the football is is huge and a game changer. I think Doug Peterson called the game differently than he was used to. There were times in the season, in previous games, where fourth and one, fourth and two aren't a big deal for us, and we go for it. But he played a little nervous, he played a little scared, and he decided to punt it because he trusted our defense. I get that. But when he decides to go for it on fourth and three instead of snagging some points, I just I just think he played the game differently. Because he knew it was a bigger stage, a different environment. I thought Carson Wentz struggled big time in the first half. It it seemed like our our structure to win this football game just wasn't there. It, it wasn't correct. And, you know, I think I, I tweeted this last night. Something like this, either we need, I, I wanted to see, there were two tweets I, I put out. The first one is, ouch, we are battling adversity tonight. I want to see this team find a way to pull out a W here. Good teams find a way to win. I wanted to see if this Eagles team had enough of, of what it has to, to find a way to win a difficult, difficult a game away in Seattle. The first time in a Russell Wilson era that this team has lost two games at home. So for us to be the third, I, I mean, it's it's definitely a tough thing to do. And they were ready to play. Then I tweeted, take some deep, deep breaths, broads. You don't win them all. I can only imagine Carson Wentz's preparation for next week will be amazing. Learning curve game. And I agree with that. I think this was good for us to an extent. I think it was time to step back. This is what we need to do. This is what we are going to have to do. Because clearly what we put out on the field on Sunday wasn't good enough coaching wise and playing wise. I think our defensive line got to Russell Wilson a ton. But he just kept extending place. I've never seen him extend plays like that so consistently. I mean, we were pushing him back 10, 15 yards because our D-line was getting a great rush, but we couldn't do anything with it because Russell Wilson was making amazing plays down the field and extending the plays. I thought there were some bad penalties that were called, were not called, but I don't think the game was because of the penalties. For example, late in the game when we were still trying to fight, there was a play that we Threw the bomb, uh, threw a bomb downfield. Our receiver got interfered with by their defender. They tripped on each other's feet. They threw the flag, pass interference, but then they picked it up and said there was no no foul on the play. Earlier in that game, we did the same thing. We accidentally ran into one of their receivers and tripped them up, and it was a pass interference play, which led to a first down. So I just thought the inconsistency was there. There were a. a one play, Darby didn't get called for a face mask, but there was about seven others that were pretty pathetic. It was just it was just a tough game for me to watch. I'm obviously venting. Here I am getting on the air and venting about what I thought I saw in the game. I'm obviously unhappy with the performance all around. 
And and it's new to me. I'm not used to this. This is this is the first time we're sitting here at 10 and 2 right now and this game is huge against the Rams. This is big for the NFC home field event. Like this is one of the biggest games of the season coming up. And it's not just because it's the next one, it's because it's legitimately for playoff seating. I'm going to be holding the remote a little tightly next week because I think we're going to have to really come out on a whole different level, a new preparation week. But I understand how Carson Wentz is as an athlete, and I think he will just be on a whole nother level of preparation for this upcoming week. The leaders of this locker room, Malcolm Jenkins, even Jason Peters. And and speaking of, Vitae struggled last night. Absolutely 100% struggled on that left side. It was just ugly. It it was just ugly. There's no doubt about it. I was watching it with a teammate of mine who is a New England Patriots fan who I speak about all the time. And it was just frustrating with him in my ear telling me Tom Brady would have done this. Tom Brady would have done that. Shut up. Just shut up. I think we didn't give up we were always battling and fighting even if we were down two touchdowns although you know we didn't get the job done it it's it's a battle thing i thought we didn't give up and our mindset was still positive even when we were losing 24 to 10 or whatever it may have been at that point down two scores i think I had belief in Carson Wentz that he would be able to make plays. Those plays that Aguilar that he made were actually ridiculous. The play where he was getting chased out of the pocket, he was clearly falling forward, and he somehow makes a amazing, literally an amazing pass. And that was an Aguilar and drops it on the dime. It's beautiful. Wentz's stats didn't look As bad as I thought, he had a way better second half than the first. It reads 29 of 45, 348 yards with one touchdown, one interception, and then clearly the lost fumble. Nelson Aguilar had seven catches for 141 yards and a touchdown. That's nice to see. I mean, if you're going to take some positives out of that, Nelson Aguilar had himself probably the best game I've ever seen him play as a Philadelphia Eagle. I'm trying not to get too down. I'm clearly upset. Clearly upset with the loss. It's not what I hope to see, but I don't think it's the end of the world. I woke up today and said, my Eagle squad is 10-2. and two. Things could be way worse. We dropped the game, and I thought it was self-inflicted to an extent. I think the Seahawks played better than us. I think we made some mental mistakes. I think the coaching was, it was not the best. But let's move on and, and see how we respond. To a game like this. Uh, I mean, we haven't been in this position. We don't know how we're going to react. My theory is our leaders are going to step up. Our running game wasn't that great. Ajayi had 35 yards on 9 carries. Carson Wentz had 30 yards on 6 carries. LeGarrette Blunt had 26 yards. <sighs> Just disappointing. Just disappointing. But it, it's not the end of the world. And I think we need to realize that. We had a bunch, how many Cowboys fans, how many Giants fans, how many fans around the league just started bashing the Eagles after that game? Just shut up. It's one football game. Giants fans, really? Geno Smith? (sighs) Just got to keep taking deep breaths. We will be okay. 10 and 2. 10 and 2. We just need to have ourselves an amazing game and find a way to win next week against the Rams. So here we go. Let's go around the league. You had the Cowboys beat the Redskins on Thursday night. I did not think we spoke about that. I I honestly wasn't that interested in that game. I don't know why. It's just because maybe at that point we're just, you know, the division run isn't really there. But... The, if the Redskins won, the Eagles would have been able to clinch the NFC East. And, and Dallas Dallas played well. I mean, Dak Prescott was 11 for 22 and 102 yards with two touchdowns. Alfred Morris with 127 yards on 27 carries. That game was kind of boring for me, though. 
You had the Vikings find a way to beat Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta. And I have friends who think the Falcons are still the real deal. Wait out, wait for them. I just don't see it. I don't think they have the same kind of oomph as they did last year when they went to the Super Bowl. Case Keenum, again, 25 for 30. 227 yards, two touchdowns. It actually blows my mind that this guy is playing this consistent. This consistent, I have to give props to him 100%. So the Vikings are now 10-2. and two. Unbelievable. It's like the NFC is so strong, so strong. The Ravens put up 44 points on the Lions. They actually played very well, very well. Being in the Baltimore area, I like to keep... The Ravens on TV, I like to watch them actually. The 1 o'clock hour, red zone, relaxed, feet up. Pretty much got to see every single game, all the plays. That's the best. One of the best things about the Birds playing at either 425 or 830 is just being able to relax and catch all the games. The Patriots win easily 23-3 to over the Bills. Tyrod Taylor leaves the game. He gets carted off. That's not good for the Bills. The Bills kind of had, you know, something more than what we expected them to have this year. I mean, they're obviously in a tough conference having to play New England, but they're sitting at 6-6. Six and six, And you lose someone like Tyrod Taylor, that's obviously going to be a huge piece of the puzzle for the Buffalo Bills and Sean McDermott. The 49ers, Jimmy Garoppolo gets his first W on a field goal at the end of the game to win 15 to 14 to defeat the Bears, the Buccaneers beat or the Buccaneers fall to the Packers 26 to 20. Jameis Winston 270 yards, two touchdowns. Brett Hundley 13 to 22, 84 yards. Not that great on, on the stat sheet for Brett Hundley, but Hey, they find a way to win, and what scares me the most, what scares me the most is Aaron Rodgers coming back within two weeks. Another downer on the day, for sure, to be an Eagles fan. I mean, you never know with this guy. This guy can come out and literally do anything he wants on the football field, and as long as their team stays in contention and, and finds a way to make the playoffs, they're a whole different squad with Aaron Rodgers, obviously, and you never know what can happen, and that truly truly scares me they are sitting at six and six i mean they're not completely out of it yet for the wild card spot eight and four so they're two games back essentially to the carolina panthers they they can find a way to get in they're not dead yet they are absolutely not dead yet Jets beat the Chiefs. The Jet that was the most exciting game of the one o'clock hour. I mean, very intriguing. Very, very intriguing. McCown, 331 yards with a touchdown. I just thought that their whole entire receiving core for the New York Jets played great. Curse 157 yards. Anderson 107 yards. I mean, Curse's longest was 51 yards. I thought the game was played beautifully. What this Jets squad? I mean, this Jets squad. It's the Jets and the Bills both thinking that they were going to have some down years, find ways to to win football games, and this Jets team had a very exciting game, and they beat a struggling Chiefs team who falls to six and six, but is still in playoff contention in in that AFC division. Alex Smith had a had a 70 yard run in this football game. But he ends up throwing for 366 yards on 19 catches out of 33 attempts. Tyree Kill had 185 yards and two touchdowns. Travis Kelsey started the game off very hot. He had 94 yards and two touchdowns. And the first two possessions, I mean it was 14 0 Kansas City. I thought here we go. They found their way. And somehow the Jets. The Jets find the way. And that's what I wanted to see out of the Eagles team. Find a way to beat the Seahawks when you were down, when you were facing adversity. Find a way. They just couldn't. They could not do that. The Saints beat the Panthers at home. Another another W for the Saints. The Rams beat the Cardinals. And the Raiders beat the Giants. 24-17. 
so where I'm just taking a step back on where are we with this NFC, which I like to do after every Monday. But this NFC is really hot. I mean, it's super hot. You have the Rams, 9-3. and three. Seattle right behind them at 8-4 and four in the NFC West. You have the New Orleans Saints sitting at 9-3 and three on the NFC South with Carolina right behind them at 8-4. and four, And Atlanta at 7-5 and five right behind them. Minnesota 10-2. and two. Philly 10-2. and two. I mean, if we lose to the Rams, we're tied with the Rams and, and head-to-head. Oh. I hate thinking about it, and I hate being down. I shouldn't be down. I stated this in our segment of the Eagles. I can't be down, but it's hard to hard to feel great. It is. But you just got to sit back and look at the big picture. 10-2. and two. I had this team at 7-9, and 8-8, eight eight or 9-7. We are sitting at 10-2. and two. I have to realize that. Just frustrating. And I know we're in a tough conference. I mean, this NFC team has a lot of talent. So we got to figure it out and make sure that we continue to strive in the right direction. That's all. So so that's where we are with the NFL for this week. Let's move along to some college football. Because we had the championship games. On Friday night, you have USC beat Stanford. And I thought the Pac-12 was not great this year. I mean, they won 31-28. to They won by a field goal. I always stated that USC, you know, didn't really have that extra what they needed to be a a playoff team earlier in the season. And then I think the Pac-12 was a little weak this year. They definitely did not have powerhouse squads that deserve to be in the college for a playoff. But hey, you win the Pac-12. That's awesome. That is great. And congratulations to USC. The, The game of the day was the American Athletic Conference, the AAC, with a UCF team taking down Memphis 62-55 to in double overtime with a coach who brought an 0-12 squad of UCF to a 12-0 team and winning their conference. And not only that, there was a report that came out during the game that their head coach took the Nebraska job. And he was crying in the interview. Because he knows that what he did with this team was truly special and he's going to have to move forward. Oklahoma destroys TCU. That wasn't even a contest. 41-17. Baker Mayfield makes his Heisman push even stronger. 15-23. 243 yards and 4 throwing touchdowns with zero interceptions. They just outplayed them completely. Same with this Georgia-Auburn game. 28-7. Auburn just... Eh, seven points. They didn't really have what it takes. Georgia totally outplayed them, and they find themselves in a playoff spot, which we will get to the playoff spots. And this Clemson-Miami game was brutal. I was very disappointed. Clemson just showed dominance, 38-3. to At one point, I was going to discuss how you're going to have two very, very great games on at 8 o'clock at the same time, and I don't know which ones to watch. Why are you doing this to me? And it ended up being okay because, you know, Clemson 38-3. to There was no contest. They cut the turnover chain in half in the locker room. It dominated. Dominated is an understatement. And they're ready to prove. Here we go. Back-to-back. We are now the new Bama. You want to win a national championship? You come to Clemson. And that's what they're trying to, trying to say. And then Ohio State. Beats Wisconsin, undefeated Wisconsin, number four Wisconsin, in the playoff Wisconsin at the time, 27-21. to That game was a little bit more interesting. Ohio State still had control, I felt, of, of the game, definitely. But Wisconsin held in there, they battled, and Ohio State wins the Big Ten. But was it enough to get in the playoff? Was it enough? Now, after those games occurred, we had a feeling Clemson was one. Oklahoma was two. Georgia was three. We knew those three were in. And it came down to four. Alabama or Ohio State. Now, Ohio State won the Big Ten, and they always say, conference champion, that is huge. Being a conference champion helps your resume. And when you look at it, they Ohio State had a, a Penn State win. They had... Uh, two top 10 wins. Alabama's best win was LSU, which was ranked 17 at the time. Now I posted 
on sportstalkwithbroads.boards.net before the college poll came out. And I said, well, time for a huge debate. Who was number four? And I heard this on ESPN, which I believe is 100% true. If you are looking for the best team to slide into that fourth spot, it is easily Alabama when it comes to the best team. The most deserving team, Ohio State. Now, I think that this just proves the college football playoff totally has uh, some spots where they need to fix it. They definitely need to fix some of these spots because you have a team like Ohio State who at this point I will say, obviously you should know that they did not get in. Alabama fit into that fourth spot after Ohio State won the conference championship. I think they had a better resume throughout the regular season. But but Alabama is a better football team and you know, it it defeats the purpose of certain things of the resume building. Does conference champion matter? I mean, Ohio State got in in 2016, and they did not win the conference championship. So this just happened to, now they're on the other side. How do they feel about it? Iowa beat Ohio State by 30-plus points. I mean, put up 50-plus points in the football game. And that truly is, is what hurt Ohio State's resume. You can't lose that badly to an Iowa team. Sorry, I have the hiccups. You just can't. And I think they got it right, but for the four-team playoff, that is, I think they need to expand it. And I mentioned before that they should expand it to six. People are talking about maybe even expanding the field to eight, which would really open up a lot of things. And and I, and I wouldn't mind that. It's just, I mean, I get it, more money. It's all there for them, more money, more games. But it, would it make the season longer? I mean, at this point, it would be Clemson, Oklahoma, Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, Wisco, Auburn, and USC all playing for the for a national championship with Penn State and Miami sitting at 9 and 10. It would totally make it more interesting. I don't think that they would pop right into throwing in eight teams. I mentioned six earlier, but, I mean, it is. It's more money for the NCAA, so I, I don't see why... Uh, they don't do it. Uh, I mean, clearly there is an outrage which, with how they are picking these four teams. Real quickly, though, you do have some really good bowl games. I mean, you have Miami playing Wisconsin in the Capital One Orange Bowl. You have Auburn playing UCF in the Peach Bowl. You have Washington playing Penn State in the Fiesta Bowl. I mean, there are still some great bowl games. You have Ohio State playing USC in the Cotton Bowl. And then obviously for the National Championship, you have the Sugar Bowl and the Rose Bowl games. But in reality, those games don't really matter. I mean, you're excited to win that game to go to the National Championship game. Don't get me wrong. But these teams aren't out here playing for the Rose Bowl. Also in huge college football news, Herm Edwards is now the head coach of Arizona State, and I think that is huge. Arizona State is going to legitimately uh, bring in a ton of prospects with a coach like that. NFL talent, NFL ready. I mean, it is going to be serious, I think, for the Pac-12 and ASU. I think that's a huge move to hire a (coughs) head— I'm sorry. To hire a head coach like that is A+. I mean, that might be the best coach in college football when it comes to knowing the game at the NFL level. So that is where we are with college football. I thought it was a very interesting weekend for college football, for sure. And one of the greatest things about college football is Gus Johnson on the call. He is clearly, no doubt in my mind, clearly, the best commentator in all of sports. His passion, his energy level. I wish he still did some college hoops. You always see him on Fox. He used to be on CBS. His passion level is tremendous. One of the best ever. Seriously, one of the best ever. And let's finish off with Sixers. The 76ers, to me, are beating the teams that they should be beating, which is great. And you can't complain about that, but we're, we're missing a tier. We can't beat the Cavs. We can't beat Golden State. We can't beat the Celtics. Although we don't have Embiid, it, it kind of pisses me off with this no back-to-back thing. I'm, I'm already over it. Apparently, he came out and said, I'm done with this too, but until I see it, 
I, I, it just bothered me a lot that he what he he does not play the back to back, especially against a Celtics team in the TD Garden. I mean, come on. Let's look at their last couple games. They play tonight, actually, um, at home, which will be exciting to watch. I believe it's today the seventh. Oh no, no, no! They do, they do. They play today. They play uh, the Suns at home. So they beat the Pistons. 108 to 103. You had Joel Embiid hyping up the 76ers crowd when Andre Drummond fouls out on him. JJ Redick says that this is the coolest arena, coolest atmosphere he's ever played in. And the Wells Fargo Center brings the passion. And that's so awesome to hear. You had Joel Embiid with 25 points, 10 rebounds. You had Robert Covington, 25 points, 8 rebounds. Dario Scharch. 17 points, 7 rebounds. Ben Simmons with only 5 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists that game. But that's a W. We're sitting at 13 and 9. Just taking a look at, at the schedule we, in their last couple games, we lose to the Celtics. We lose to the Cavs. We beat the Wizards by 5, but that was without a John Wall, which we've lost to in the past. We lose to the Warriors. But the games we win, they're the games we are supposed to win. And in the East, I get it, that is going to get us to where we need to be, which is in the playoffs. But, I mean, you know, we beat the Pistons. That's great. We beat the Wizards without John Wall. Like I said, we crushed the Magic. We beat the Jazz. We beat the Trailblazers. We beat the Lakers. I mean, they're fun and exciting every single night. Don't get me wrong, but we need that next step. We need something. We just need something. I I don't know what the answer is. If I did, uh, I'd be a millionaire and be on the Sixers coaching staff. But there is something that's not there. And, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Tweet at me, at Sports and Broads, on Twitter. Call into the show using your voice memo app on your iPhone, recording yourself, and send it to sportsandbroads at gmail.com. Hell, talk on the blog. www.sportstalkwithbroads.boards.net. The link is in the description. Let me know. If I'm ridiculous, or let me know if you agree with me, but there is something that needs to put us over this edge. Now, reports have it that we are on a huge LeBron James push in this offseason. I don't know how serious it is. Are we a team that are interesting to look at and are appealing maybe to LeBron James? I couldn't imagine us not. Is Ben Simmons too similar of a player of, of Le- LeBron James? I can see that being an issue maybe, but LeBron James will make anything work. It, it all depends on how everything falls in Cleveland, how they do this year, how the players play at the end of the year together. Was it like a positive loss or, you know, was it like a, damn, we could have had that one, but we just, we or was it a dominating performance by the Golden State Warriors? It really, truly all depends on how the season goes. I just can't imagine the man leaving Cleveland again. I mean, he has his heart and passion and soul into that city. He said he would like to be a part owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers after he has finished. I mean, I don't know. I just can't imagine LeBron James picking up his lifestyle in Cleveland, which we all know he loves so much. To say, I want to go to Philadelphia. But if we're the team, I mean, stop. Tears are, tears are literally falling out of my face just thinking about it. Just thinking about it. Is it a possibility? I mean, I guess the possibility is there. But, I mean, I'm not getting my hopes up. So, with that being said, I'm going to end this episode here. To recap, the, the, the Eagles loss hurts. But it's not the end of the world. 10 and 2, bro. It's 10 and 2 for everyone listening. Could be worse. College football had an amazing weekend. We now have our playoff and bowl games set. And I think they did the right job putting Alabama in over Ohio State. I'm sorry if you disagree. And the Sixers. We're missing a little something to get us over the hump to get to the next point. But we are beating the teams we are supposed to beat. As always, follow me on Twitter at Sports and Broads. Once again, call into the show. It's awesome. Call into the show. The passion we had last episode because you're upset about something, it's remarkable. Use your voice memo app. Send it in, sportsandbroads at gmail.com. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Love the support so far.
Let's keep grinding. Almost at 1,500 downloaded episodes. I cannot wait. Have a great day, everybody. We are getting close to Christmas. It is now December. Pretty wild. Have a great one, everyone. And see you guys next time.